Welcome back to chapter 15, where we are going to talk about the solar cycle, the fact that the sun is not always at the same level of activity, and the different observations that we have made to be able to confirm the ideas that scientists put forth. So all of this actually goes back to chapter 2 when we talked about Galileo and the telescope that he built in the 1600s and all of the different observations he made because one of the observations that he made with his telescope was that the sun has what are called sunspots and he was able to actually trace those sunspots from one day to the next to look and see that the sun rotates on its own axis the same way that the earth rotates as well. What's more interesting though is that the sun does not rotate as a single solid object the way the Earth does. Instead, if we look at how the sunspots move over the course of each day, around the sun's equator, they actually move faster, and around the um, higher latitudes, further away from the sun's equator, they move slower. Now, astronomers are able to trace not only how many sunspots there are, but also where those sunspots appear. And when they do, they can graph them uh, over time. Now, this diagram here is showing from 1870 to now. And it's important to recognize that we actually have counts of sunspots all the way back to Galileo's time. At least a handful of people, not necessarily full, full-time astronomers, but at least a handful of people over time have made observations of how many sunspots they see every day that we have a record that goes back hundreds of years. Now on the top we have what's called a butterfly diagram. It is telling us how many sunspots appear using color and where those sunspots appear in um, latitude. So EQ means equator along the sun's equator, and 90 degrees north would be at the sun's north pole, and 90 degrees south would be at the sun's south pole. And what we see is that the sunspots from one year to the next go from higher latitudes, further away from the equator, and year after year, they show up closer and closer to the equator until it seems like someone just pushes a big reset button and the process starts over again. Now the top of this is called a butterfly diagram because it looks kind of like a butterfly. And it's worth recognizing that the bottom half is just showing us basically sunspot count, sunspot number, in this case, the overall percentage of the surface that is covered in sunspots. And we can see that when that person presses the big reset button on the sun, the sunspot count goes down considerably, but then builds itself back up again. If we look at this in a little bit more detail, the vertical lines in the graph are every 10 years. And although it looks like it's similar to that 10 years, it's a little bit more than that. This is a cycle that repeats every 11 years or so, but roughly every 11 years. Now let's come back to this statement that I made about how we can track sunspots. When we watch them move, we actually see that the sun has differential rotation. That means that the equator material, the plasma near the equator rotates faster than the plasma near the poles. If you're curious, the sun takes about 27 days for the plasma to move around the equator it takes about 31 days to move around the pole. We don't need those numbers, but if you're trying to get a sense of things, it really is something we can track from one day to the next because it's not um, taking years to do this. Uh, and it's something where we can visibly see the difference between a 27 year rotation, a 27 day rotation and a 31 day rotation. Now the magnetic field of the sun is a complex topic. We won't get too much into details of it in this class, but we can kind of think about having a tennis ball that we have wrapped a bunch of um, rubber bands around. If we pull on those rubber bands near the middle of the tennis ball and kind of try to wrap them up and up um, the way that this diagram is showing, 
at some point, if we stretch a rubber band too much, it will break. That is true about magnetic field lines as well. If they are made too complex, too much of this wrapping, the field lines snap and basically reset themselves. They reset themselves upside down. So in 11 years, the sun goes from being like a nice smooth set of lines on the left where north is at the top. 11 years later, it resets itself. So north is at the bottom. And so technically this is a 22 year cycle, but the sun's behavior of being active and inactive is definitely every 11 years. It's not a big difference between what pole is at the top or not. So when there are a lot of sunspots, the sun is more active. So let's use this pair of pictures to investigate what was happening in 1996 compared to what was happening in 2001 compared again to 2006. So on the left picture here, in 1996, the number of sunspots was very low. This is called solar minimum. In 2001, the count of sunspots was near its peak. We call this solar maximum. And then in 2006, this is now 10 years later, the sun was back down to almost um, no activity. And so the sun was at solar minimum again. Now, along with this solar minimum and solar maximum, one of the things that we can keep track of is not just sunspots in the photosphere, but active regions in the corona. Now it is really important for us to be able to see in this pair of pictures, both of which are happening on the same day in 2013, that in the same places where there are sunspot groups, there are loops of magnetic material. Now I'm gonna use the cursor here on the left, this sunspot group, although it looks less impressive to us in the photosphere, it's actually the place where there's very brightly lit up um, magnetic field lines. We see the plasma, not the magnetic field, but it's following the field lines. And in this place where there are larger sunspots, we actually see that um, although there are magnetic field lines because we're watching the plasma move off of them, it doesn't look as impressive to us. So these are consistent with each other. Active regions and sunspots are um, manifestations of the same thing. They are locations on the sun where magnetic field has gone above the surface uh, and the sunspots are showing us where those um, loops kind of hit the surface and active regions show us plasma actually following those loops of material. Now sunspots are dark because they are cold. The lower temperature comes from really strong magnetic fields that prevent that convective motion that we talked about briefly in the previous video. On the far right here, we have a picture um, that is called a magnetogram. It is not a, um, it is not an image using a specific wavelength of light, but it is using a piece of physics called the Zeeman effect. It's described in the textbook and you're welcome to um, read through that if you're interested. It's outside the scope of our curriculum. It's using the Zeeman effect to tell us where there is strong magnetic field, white and black, and where there is weak magnetic field, just gray. In that same place where we see strong magnetic field, there would have been a sunspot group and in these three other pictures where the wavelengths are shown down here in angstroms, all three of those wavelengths are ultraviolet. They've been color coded for our convenience, but they are not wavelengths that the human eye can actually see otherwise. They're showing us places in the corona where we see active regions. Now, flares and coronal masses, uh, coronal mass ejections, those are both pieces of solar activity that we will describe in the next video. They both originate in active regions. Now, flares are what we call high energy photons that are released by activity in these active regions. So we're talking about X-rays usually, but it's, it's light, electromagnetic spectrum, photons. It's light when we talk about flares. 
In coronal mass ejections is physical material. The plasma itself is sent away from the sun. So when we have these active regions, in this picture here, um, five of them are indicated on a particular day um, during an active part of the cycle. When we have these active regions, these are places where we are likely to see flares and coronal mass ejections. But if we take this exact same picture and we instead highlight coronal holes, so you might be able to guess from the picture, and now I've indicated them here, so I'll go back and forth a bit. These coronal holes are places in the solar corona where it is dark, not because it is colder, but because there is less material there. Coronal holes are the primary source of the fast solar wind, which is another aspect of solar activity that we'll discuss in the next video. It is important for us to be aware that a common mistake students make is mixing up coronal holes with sunspots because they both look dark in the imagery that we have for them. But sunspots are dark because they are cold. Coronal holes are dark because there is lower density of stuff. We had a couple of slides back that sunspots are related to um, active regions, really bright parts of the corona, highlighted here. Those are where we would see sunspots in the photosphere. In a completely different area entirely is where we are seeing these coronal holes. And they are dark for a completely different reason. So we do not want to confuse those two structures um, because they really don't have anything in common except for that very generalized statement that they are dark in images of them. So in the next video, we will be talking about space weather and how these terms that we've introduced in this video actually affect the Earth. So I will see you in the next video.